Welcome back. Um, I know today, was, yesterday was a tough day, but you got through it. Um, and today we're going to cover the basics of introduction to metagenomics um, and specifically the things that are really relevant for when you're working with ancient metagenomics. Okay. So first up, what's a metagenome? Metagenome is the collection of, geno of genomes and genes from the members of a microbiota. And this collection is obtained through shotgun sequencing of DNA extracted from a sample, that's called metagenomics, followed by mapping to a reference database or by assembly, followed by annotation. And a microbiota is an assemblage of microorganisms that are present in a defined environment. And a microbiome refers to an entire habitat, including the microorganisms, their genomes, and the surrounding environmental conditions. And these definitions come from an article that was written in 2015 by Marchese and Ravel called The Vocabulary of Microbiome Research. And this article was really important because before this article, um, there was kind of a terminology wild west when it came to the metagenomics and the microbiome with little agreement on what any of these terms meant. So this you know, why do we need an entire, entire scientific article just about vocabulary? It was really to sort out a lot of confusion that had built up in the literature over many years. And it's because the terminology about microbes really is a mess. So when you start working with microbes, you'll start to realize microbes change names, terms change definitions, and this can be really confusing. So every now and again, it's really important to update the field on new consensus terms and ideas. So, for example, the term metagenome was originally co uh, coined by uh, Jo Handelsmann in 1988, but she used it to mean something totally different. Metagenomics over the years was occasionally used to refer to 16S rRNA amplification, something that we now call metataxonomics. And microbiome is claimed to have been coined at least twice, but each time meaning something completely different. So either a microbial biome meaning a microbial community, which is a definition proposed in 1988, or a microbiota-ome, meaning the collective genomes of a microbiota in 2001. But actually, the term microbiome can be traced back in use, if you look through Google Books, for example, to at least 1894. So we've had these terms floating around with different definitions and no consensus for quite a long time. So this article in 2015 was really important in establishing some common definitions that we can all use to help move the field forward. So I wanted to point this out because if you read articles prior to 2015, you may see uses of these terms that differ from what I'm gonna talk about today. And I just wanna explain why that is. All right, so how do these terms apply to what we're going to do, which is um, work with ancient metagenomics? How does it apply to archeological samples and to the past? Well, ancient metagenomics is a study of the collection of genes and genomes of all the microbiotas that are present within a given environment or a microbiome, but also plus all the other DNA that's mixed in. Basically, it's all of the DNA in your sample. And the key point here, when you're working with ancient microbiomes, which is quite different or ancient metagenomes compared to a modern one, is that in addition to all the anti-mortem genetic material of any microbes that might have been present during life, Ancient metagenomes almost always contain at least some post-mortem bacteria from the necrobiome, so from those bacteria that are decomposing that sample. So ancient metagenomics in many ways is like regular metagenomics, but harder because other environmental microbiota of various ages are mixed in and because the ancient DNA is uh, degraded. All right. So let me use a couple of metaphors, and I think it's kind of helpful then to visualize what ancient metagenomics is. So yesterday I used the kind of the, the metaphor for ancient DNA of a jigsaw puzzle. And I said that, um, that ancient DNA is sort of like the worst puzzle ever. It's like puzzles with 60,000 pieces or 5 million pieces. So you can think of that as with ancient DNA. And you can think of an ancient metagenome as similar, except it's not just one puzzle, it's all the puzzles. And it may be that mixed in with all these different genomes from the past, you might only be interested in one thing. Maybe all you care about is the human genome, but you still have to contend with all the other DNA that's mixed in from all the other sources. Or maybe all you care about is your pestis because you're interested in plague. 
But again, you have all the other puzzles, all the other genomes mixed in, and they're not neatly bound in their little boxes. They're completely mixed up pieces. And in fact, in many cases, it's as if someone lost the boxes, so you don't even know what the picture is supposed to look like. And so for those of us who are interested in the microbiome, instead of being interested in just one or two things, like the human genome or the Yersinia pestis genome, for those of us who are interested in the microbiome, we are interested in all the puzzles. But as I said before, they're all mixed up. And so that's one of the challenges we have, trying to reassociate them with their original puzzle and put some order to this big mess of ancient DNA. So that's the puzzle metaphor of, of ancient metagenomics. And I'd like to propose another metaphor to give you also a kind of sense of the scale of the problem. And I call this my, uh, this is a metaphor using a, a coral reef. And I like this metaphor because if you think about a microbial ecology, it's an ecology. It's a whole community of microbes that live together in symbiotic relationships and they have um, an enormous amount of species diversity and richness and there's many, many different organisms uh, living together in this complex habitat, all interacting. And that habitat is incredibly interesting and those relationships are important. And so when we study something like the microbiome, what we're interested in is reconstructing that entire ecology, that entire ecosystem. Now, one of the members of the coral reef that's really important and plays an important role is the parrotfish. It's one of my favorite fish. And you may not be familiar with it, but you have experienced the parrotfish before. Because parrotfish eat coral, um, it's their main source of food, and they poop out sand. So anytime you sat on a nice white sand beach and thought, this is just beautiful, you are sitting on parrotfish poop. And you can apply this metaphor then to the past and think, well, if this coral reef is sort of like everything that ever existed in the past, and my little parrotfish here is like time, then this is our ancient DNA, sort of the pooped out, chewed up bits of that ancient ecosystem. So I call this my parrotfish metaphor of ancient metagenomics. And our job is to start with this pile of sand and to try to use the tools we have available in the lab and computationally to try to imagine what that original coral reef, that original ecology was like. At this point, you may be thinking, oh, dear God, what have I signed myself up for? This seems very hard. Don't worry. We have a lot of tools available, and we can do it. And it's important, and we can learn really incredible things about the past using these techniques. So today, we're going to cover a few questions, some of our starting questions, when we have our little pile of sand, our little pile of ancient metagenomic DNA, and we're trying to make sense of it. The first question we really want to ask is, who's there? What species may have been present? We next want to understand, well, how preserved is this sample? Is it really degraded? Has it been altered? Am I only looking at contamination? Then you want to be able to clean up your data set, uh, remove some things that are obvious contaminants, and adjust it a bit so that you have a clearer sense of the original picture. And ultimately, what you want to reconstruct is your original microbial community. And that's your goal. Those are the kinds of, this is what we're going to cover today, is how do you get to that point? And then later in the course, you'll cover some other analyses that you can do once you've reconstructed that community. You can, for example, explore the genomes that are there, the metagenome assembled genomes. And you'll learn about that on Thursday. Or you maybe you're interested in only looking for something very particular, like a pathogen. That'll also be covered tomorrow. Or maybe you want to know, what does my microbial community do? What's its functions? And that'll be covered on Friday. All right, so let's get started with the question of who's there. So at the most basic level, the first question you always ask in ancient metagenomics is, who's there? Who is in this community? And that is a really hard question because scientists cannot agree on what a microbial species is. So if you're trying to put together a list of species, you already have a big problem because we have a real problem with defining what a microbial species is. And that's because our concept for what a species is, called the biological species concept, which was developed by Ernst Mayer, was developed for birds. And microbes are very, very different from birds in many ways. First of all, they reproduce asexually. And second of all, they can actually transfer parts of their genome, not just between members of the same species, but across members of different species, genera, families, and even phyla. 
So microbes really behave very differently than many other uh, uh, forms of life uh, where we have more familiar definitions of species. And that's okay. We have a kind of provisional understanding of what a species is um, in terms of microbes that we uh, base on uh, sequence differences between their genomes. And so we're just going to use that for our primary analyses. And what we want when we're trying to understand you know, who is there is we want to look at taxonomy and phylogeny. So taxonomy meaning that different species have different names and we can give them a name, but those names and those groupings are phylogenetically coherent, meaning they all belong to a group. So here is a tree that's been um, made for Tanarella and Porphyromonas, which are two abundant bacteria that live in the mouth. And here the taxonomy and the phylogeny agree. So everything that's colored in red belongs to the genus Porphyromonas and it forms a clade. And everything that is in uh, green here is Tanarella and it forms a clade. So the taxonomy and the phylogeny are in agreement. But that's not true for all microbes, especially microbes that were named and studied a long time ago, like Escheria, Shigella, Salmonella, and Klebsiella. This is a group of bacteria that contain a lot of pathogens, many of which have been studied for more than 100 years. And these different pathogens behave very differently in humans and cause different types of diseases. And so they've been classified historically as different species. But if we look at their genomes, what we can see is that their taxonomy does not match their phylogeny. Re in reality, all of these should really be characterized as a type of Klebsiella because these little branches fall within the diversity of Klebsiella. But the tree has not been updated. The nomenclature has not been updated in part because they're so clinically important in hospitals and in medicine that we retain the names, even though they actually fail the definition of being distinct species or even genera. So this is just an example of where things can get a little bit complicated. But ideally what you want is your taxonomy and your phylogeny to be in agreement. So I'm going to say here that our definition of species within microbes is fuzzy. It's not a firm boundary. It's a bit of a fuzzy boundary, and it depends a little bit on the methods you're using, how you might choose to define it for your analyses. For our purposes, we're going to be using the Linnaean uh, classification scheme for bacteria. Um, and so uh, you'll see uh, something like this repeated over and over again when you're generating taxon lists and you're doing classification of your different sequences that each sequence will be classified taxonomically and given a string of identifiers. So at the lowest level will be the species name. So here's James's favorite bacteria, this uh, Capna cytophaga uh, gingivalis. It belongs to the species Capna cytophaga. Gosh, that's really hard to say. Um, it has a family in Flavobacteriaceae, belongs to the order Flavobacteriales, belongs to the class Bacterioidea, the phylum, bacteriodota, and the domain, bacteria. And so you can trace this uh, taxonomic uh, kind of trail for every species. All right, but how do you go from your raw DNA sequences to these taxon tables, right? It's all fine and good to have all these DNA sequences, but you wanna know who's there. Well, we use taxonomic profilers for this, and you actually have multiple different options available. There's not just one way to assign taxonomy to your reads. There's actually multiple different ways. And you might select different options depending on the types of analyses or outcomes you want to have. You can roughly group them into two groups. Most of the taxonomic profilers are what are called alignment-based, where they actually um, align your sequences to a database of reference genomes or genes. And some of the most common ones that do this, um, for example, the CHIME software suite for 16S ribosomal RNA marker genes, or Metaflon, which uses a marker gene set, so not just one gene, but many genes, or, or MALT, which just does read alignment and binning to a given database, and that can be either genomes or uh, in any format that you give it. And then you have a very different way of, ta of profiling taxonomy, and that's using an alignment-free method. Um, and an example of this would be Kraken, which I've misspelled. There's no C. Um, and that uses something called Kamer matching. 
All right, well, let's start with the classic one. This is one that you've probably heard of, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about it because it had such an enormous impact on the field of microbiology. And this is what we would call 16S ribosomal RNA amplicon metataxonomics. So there's a gene that is shared by all prokaryotes, meaning all bacteria and all archaea, called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, and it encodes um, a major portion of the ribosomes, which are the organelles that make um, uh, proteins. Um, and it's ubiquitous among prokaryotes. It's about 1,600 bases long. And what's really special about it is it contains conserved and hypervariable regions. So there's regions of this gene which are almost completely invariant across all forms of microbial life, and then parts of the gene that are hypervariable. In fact, they can be so variable that you can use them as a kind of barcode to use the sequence to determine the species identification or at least the genus. For this method, instead of it being metagenomics, it's a PCR-based approach where we amplify up parts of the 16S RNA gene. And this, uh, the part that you amplify up, these hypervariable regions, is often referred to as a barcode. And so you might have heard of this technique referred to as meta-barcoding. And they also use the same term when they're using a similar approach to look at diversity within eukaryotes for the, say, the 12S ribosomal RNA gene, or sometimes with plants, with ITS sequences. Um, this kind of uh, approach is very common across biology, this metabarcoding approach. There's lots of different tools that you can use to analyze these amplified sequences. For example, Mother or RDP classifier or Chime is probably the major one used today. And the advantage of it is there's truly enormous databases. So by far the most comprehensive databases in terms of sequence um, diversity and coverage of the tree of life come from these 16S marker gene databases. Um, something like Silva is truly enormous, has many, many, many um, uh, bacteria and archaea in it. And the advantage of it is that it's, a, it's efficient and it's quite inexpensive. And so it's widely used today within microbial ecology for modern DNA. And it's really cool. I mean, many discoveries have been made um, using the 16S gene, including the entire discovery of the domain of life, archaea. So it is what led Carl Woese in 1990 to discover that our tree of life here was incomplete and that there was an entirely new branch of the tree of life that we had completely overlooked because it is difficult to culture. Um, and it was discovered through 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing. And this branch includes some of our friends from the microbiome that you might be familiar with, such as Methanobrevibacter oralis, which lives in the oral cavity, or Methanobrevibacter smithii that lives in your gut. And these are two archaea that live in your bodies. All right, but there's some serious problems when trying to apply this to ancient DNA. So this is when, um, when the gene is expressed, it produces this RNA, but then auto-assembles into a secondary structure that looks like this, is which makes up part of the ribosome. The region that is used, has been used most frequently for ancient DNA is this hypervariable 3 region, and that's because it's the shortest variable region that also has good taxonomic discrimination. But there's problems. First, it's length polymorphic. Depending on the species, it actually has shorter or longer segments of different parts of the gene. And so if you were to map this out, the types, the lengths of the DNA you would get if you amplified this up vary from around 150 to almost 200 bases. And it varies by taxonomy. It's length polymorphic. Also, it's just too long. The average length is 180 base pairs. And this is an example of the lengths of DNA found in dental calculus. Um, you can see we have an average length here, just about maybe 60 bases, but the PCR target we're trying to amplify is much longer, which means we're always amplifying out of the tail of the distribution, which can lead to all sorts of biases um, in the results that we obtain. So unfortunately, 16S ribosomal RNA amplicon metataxonomics cannot be used for ancient microbial DNA because it leads to systematic biases in the types of microbes that you recover based on these length polymorphisms and the shortness of the ancient DNA reads. It is possible to analyze 16S ribosomal sequences 
within your metagenomic data. So you can take your metagenomic data, your shotgun metagenomic data, and look for 16S sequences in it, but there's some problems with that. This gene only represents less than 0.05% of the sequences. So you actually have to sequence quite a lot of DNA to have enough to analyze, and that makes it inefficient. And also trying to classify very short 16S sequences is quite error prone. So there's some real problems trying to do it. So the field has now moved on and we recommend alternative approaches using metagenomics for classifying the sequences in your ancient metagenomics data set. So goodbye 16S RNA, very, very sad. So today we're gonna to talk about the three main workhorses that we use for analyzing ancient metagenomic DNA. And that's Metaflon, Malt, and Kraken. Again, I spelled it wrong, I'm sorry. It improves as we go along the slides. All right, so let's start with Metaflon. Metaflon uses a marker gene set. So what it does is it takes short read DNA sequences and a database of marker genes that have been predetermined to be highly specific to certain clades. And the current database, which is version three, contains 1.1 million markers um, that are obtained from bacteria, archaea, and microeukaryotes. And by so pre-selecting these markers, um, it makes it more efficient. Um, so you're ignoring all the DNA that maybe isn't very taxonomically discriminating and focusing your attention just on the regions of the DNA that are going to give you the most phylogenetic and taxonomic information. It's had several versions, as you can see here, there was Metaflon, Metaflon 2, we're currently in Metaflon 3, and Metaflon 4 is in development, and one of the new features it's going to have is the integration of these new metagenomically assembled genomes called MAGs, which we'll talk about later. So some of the pros of Metaflon is it uses metagenomic DNA data, and so it works really well with ancient DNA. It's pretty computationally efficient. Um, the marker database is quite good if you're interested in pathogens or the human microbiome, but it has some cons. Um, because it uses a defined marker database that's pre-compiled for you, you can't customize it. So you are kind of stuck with the database they have. The marker database is missing some taxa that might be relevant if you're looking at other animal microbiomes or environmental DNA from, uh, for example, sediments. Those genomes are not going to be well represented in that database, so you might under-identify them. And it only profiles microbes. So it's not going to tell you anything about plants or animals or anything else. But overall, it's a pretty good option for human associated ancient microbes and microbiomes. It was developed by Curtis Huttenhauer and Nicola Sagata. And this team has actually developed a lot of really um, helpful microbiome software tools. And you'll see some of them later in the course. So some of the other tools they've developed, they've developed Phyloflan, and this allows you to do phylogenetic profiling of genomes and mags. PanFlan, which allows you to do pan genome strain analysis. Human, which is used for functional profiling, and you'll get to try this out on Friday. Um, and they're also vastly expanding the available microbial reference genomes um, that we have in our databases through the really large scale metagenomic assembly projects. And you'll learn more about this tomorrow. Um, for example, they published over 150,000 new meta metagenomically assembled bacterial genomes um, in 2020 and another 200,000 in 2021. So they are a really active group doing some really great work on the microbiome. Next we have MALT. This was developed by Daniel Hewson and Alexander Herbig, who will be your speaker tomorrow. It's a short read DNA sequence aligner for metagenomic data, and it's integrated into the Megan software suite, which stands for the metagenome aligner. And that's an example of what that software suite would look like. MALT itself is an acronym for Megan Alignment Tool, and it works quite similar to BLAST, but it's uh, been designed to run faster. And it was developed as a, a DNA alternative to the protein sequence aligner Diamond, which is used in Megan and in many other programs. One, uh, MALT uses all of the DNA in a data set to perform taxonomic assignment and by aligning it to a reference database, and you can choose that database. You can choose NCBI, NR, you could choose RefSeq. It can be any database that you want. A disadvantage, though, is this makes it very slow and memory intensive. However, it does maximize all the data you have available. And one good thing is it's quite customizable. So you can restrict it to only look for microbes, or you could also choose to include plants or animals or whatever you want. So you can really use it to do a comprehensive overview of what's in your sample. 
And it uses a, an LCA algorithm, a lowest common ancestor algorithm, to assign each sequence to a node in the taxonomy. So if a sequence is definitely belongs to, say, a certain family of bacteria, but it's not specific enough to say which species exactly, it'll place it at the family node. And that can be very helpful. So some pros is it maximizes the use of all the data you have. It has good database customizability. It can profile all the tax in the sample, not just the microbes. And you can use Megan, the Megan interface for quick data in inspection. And it's integrated into Eager and compatible with HOPS, which is a tool we use for pathogen screening, which you'll learn about more tomorrow. And because it produces alignments, you can easily create DNA damage profiles after having run MALT. Does have some cons, however. It is very computationally intensive with large databases. Um, and you really have to have an enormous amount of, of memory and uh, computational infrastructure to be able to run it. And the newest release has unfortunately a bug in the LCA algorithm that is not yet fixed. All right, so let's talk about our third workhorse, Kraken. Now it's spelled correctly. So Kraken is a taxonomic profile and it works by Kamer matching, which is a totally different approach instead of alignment. And the advantage of this is it makes Kraken much faster and less computationally intensive than um, alignment-based profilers. Um, its database is also customizable, and you can use it for all taxa, not just microbes. So you can use Kraken to look for plants or animals or whatever you would like. Kraken was developed by Derek Wood and Steven Salzberg, and um, they have uh, subsequently released several updates and some um, additional software. So for example, um, they've released Bracken, which allows you to account for differences in genome size when calculating species. Remember we talked yesterday that some microbial species have a genome of 1 million bases and some have 13. So uh, it's good to um, correct for those genome size differences when you're trying to estimate the abundance based on read counts. And you can do that with a tool called Bracken. Um, they've also developed a new uh, tool called Kraken Unique which can help to greatly reduce the problem of false positives that Kraken sometimes can have. And they've recently released Kraken 2, which makes uh, the Kraken algorithm work even faster. So some pros with Kraken is that it's fast. And it can be used for any set of taxa, not just microbes. And it's really great for quickly seeing what's in your data. Uh, its accuracy is good enough for most ancient microbiome studies, but if you're wanting to look at ancient pathogens, you should do more validation because it does have a problem with false positives. As I said, it can be prone to false positives. It doesn't provide alignment data, so if you want to do damage analysis, you have to perform that separately. But overall, it's a really great tool. Um, you can read about how these uh, um, different classifiers perform on ancient data in this paper here, um, written by Irina Velska, who will be a speaker tomorrow. Um, some of the take home messages are really no taxonomic profiler is perfect. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Um, false positives um, tend to be mostly in your low abundance taxa. So all of them do have problems with false positives, but generally it mainly affects things that are very low abundance. And so you can, there's different techniques you can do to mitigate that. You can remove singletons from your data set or low abundance taxa, and that can help really reduce the number of false positives. Um, overall, the taxonomic profilers generally return pretty similar results, but each one has fairly predictable biases. Um, database selection will really greatly impact the precision and the accuracy of your taxonomic assignment. So you want to give a lot of thought to the data database that you're using. And ultimately, what you need for your study is to decide which profiler or more than one profiler will be best for you. And that really depends on your question. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about databases because databases matter a lot. Many databases are incomplete. We have not fully sequenced the full diversity of life on Earth. So many, many species that might be relevant for you are not in databases. And this includes even from things that are we think we know pretty well, like the human gut microbiome or the human oral microbiome. There's still a lot of diversity that is present that has not been fully characterized or fully sequenced and is not yet in databases. And you won't find what you can't see. So you need to always check to make sure your database has the taxon of interest that you have, or if it's missing things that you know what it's missing. So you know there will be some biases and things you might not see. So let's give some examples. So a good example was the first version of Metaflon, 
It did not have the genome for Tanarella forsythia in it, which is a really common and prevalent oral microbe. And so if you analyzed your data with Metaflon, this microbe would just disappear from your data set. And if you analyze with anything else, it would reappear. Um, fortunately, the new Metaflon 2 and 3 databases have fixed this, and it's now there. But it's an example about how if you, depending on the database you use, there may be taxa that are present that you just won't see in your data output. And if your taxon is missing from the reference uh, genome, is missing a reference genome in the database, your DNA might align to the next best thing, and this can cause a false positive. And a good example of this um, comes from um, uh, acne, actually. So prior to 2012, if you tried to do taxonomic profiling of dental calculus, it was very common to see a high abundance of the skin pathogen, Propionobacterium acne. It often came up, uh, uh, it turned up in these profilers as abundant and highly prevalent. Um, but after the genome of the related oral species, Pseudopropionobacterium propionicum was published in 2012, these P. acnes disappeared from all the data sets. And that's because at the Propionobacterium acnes was actually never present in the oral cavity. Instead, it was this relative, this Pseudopropionobacterium propionicum, is very abundant in the oral cavity, but because that genome wasn't sequenced until 2012 and wasn't in the database, all the reads that belonged to that species were mistakenly misassigned to Propionobacterium acnes, and it caused this false positive. Now, just to make this even more confusing, microbiologists like to rename bacteria pretty frequently, and Propionobacterium acnes was renamed to Cutie Bacterium acnes in 2016. And I think someone who was not a teenager thought they were being very cute and funny when they renamed this organism. All right. Databases also contain junk DNA, and you need to be aware of this. Genomes in the NCBI, even the RefSeq genomes, contain errors, and sometimes they contain big errors. So James already talked about how the common CARP genome uh, was uploaded to the reference database full of sequencing adapters, which means if you have any stray sequencing adapters in your own data set, they will match to CARP, and your profiler will tell you you have the CARP genome, when in fact you don't, you just have an adapter. Another common problem is the Tibetan antelope. I'm not entirely sure what is wrong with this genome, but every single metagenomic data set has the Tibetan antelope. Um, there must be some sort of problem uh, of, of some other DNA that was accidentally uploaded alongside the Tibetan antelope, but it's typically found almost, if you'd run a profile, you'd find Tibetan antelope. And the RefSeq genome for the common soil bacterium, uh, Acromobacter denitrificans, it's a really widespread bacterium in soil, contains the entire chicken ovalbumin gene. And that's because this um, uh, microbe used to be cultivated on an egg-based medium. So you get these sorts of errors that get propagated um, in the literature. So just keep an eye out for this. One thing to really remember is that your brain and your critical thinking skills are your best defense against bad databases, bad data, and wrong conclusions. So when in doubt, check and double check. Don't just blindly trust the outputs. All right, so now from our sharing questions, we've made it to who's there. And that was a lot of work. But here's a glass of water. We're going to keep going, and we're going to get to how preserved is my sample. How do I actually tell how well preserved my sample is? So how do you then look at the metagenome composition and quality? There's lots of things that can decrease the quality of your metagenomic sample um, through degradation and contamination. And some of the causes and sources of that are the burial, envi the burial environment itself. So all of the bacteria that live in the soil and sediments um, can invade the body after death or whatever it is, the paleofeces or whatever you're looking at, the archaeological sample. And this is called the necrobiome, and it slowly degrades and decomposes and basically eats the ancient material. And so if you analyze dental calculus or bone or paleofeces, you're going to have some of these burial environment bacteria also present. You can also get postmortem microbial overgrowth of the, of the original bacteria itself. So when an organism dies, 
maybe not all the members of the gut microbiome die at the same time. So it could be that some of those bacteria continue to live for decades or centuries longer, and they can continue to grow and then become out of proportion in terms of their abundance to what they were in life. This doesn't happen that often because um, most of the bacteria that live in and on the body are thermophilic, which means they grow optimally at about 38 degrees Celsius at body temperature. And at colder temperatures, they tend to either die or grow very slowly. But some of them have greater temperature tolerance and can continue to survive um, um, after the body dies. Um, and then, of course, you have post-excavation handling and storage. So this is any kind of microbes that might have been introduced by the excavators, by the museum storage, by handling um, all along the way before it, you receive it in your laboratory. And so before you do any kind of analysis, it's pretty helpful to identify and remove these contaminant sequences from your data set before you move to your downstream analyses and interpretation. And there's a number of different software tools that can help you characterize your data set's preservation state and the potential contamination that might be present. The ones that we've been using most um, is we use kind of two approaches. One is source tracking, um, uh, and you can use the program source tracker or source predict. What those allow you to do is to estimate what proportion of your data set comes from various sources. So it's kind of a gauge of how preserved it is. And then there's different cleanup software that allow you to either identify bad samples or to strip out contaminating sequences. And we'll talk about CooperDeck and Decontam. So let's first talk about microbial source tracking. This can be performed using different approaches, either Bayesian approaches or machine learning methods to estimate to what degree your data derives from a particular microbial source. So there's two main methods. There's the source tracker two uh, developed out of Dan Knight's lab and Source Predict, uh, which was developed by Maxine Bory, who'll be your instructor this afternoon. Um, the user provides reference metagenomes, for example, dental black or feces or soil as potential sources. And the tool estimates the proportion of your data set that derives from one or more of these sources. So here's an example of Source Tracker 2 from one of James's papers, um, where we were looking at dental calculus from a variety of uh, humans and non-human primates. And so the x-axis there um, are all the different uh, samples in our data set. So you'll see them as columns here in just a minute. And we gave the sources that you see on the right. So what we were hoping to see was a strong oral signal. So hopefully most of the plot will be red, and that would indicate that our samples have a high amount of um, oral uh, um, uh, bacteria in the samples. And we ordered them by um, how much uh, estimated dental plaque source they have. And you can see there's a gradient. And this is pretty typical of a lot of ancient microbiome samples, as you'll see a gradient. Um, you can see here, these look pretty good. And um, that's because those are almost all modern dental plaque samples. So those are kind of um, the best case scenario. And these look really bad. So these are some of our uh, museum samples, especially for some of the primates that just weren't preserved very well at all. And what this indicates is there's very little left of the oral microbiome there. It's almost completely decomposed. So these samples are really not worth following up on. In the middle, you have a gradient of preservation. And there's not really a fixed cutoff of when you would say, I'm going to not look at this. But you need to take into account the degree of preservation and making some of your downstream decisions for interpretation. Now, you can also get a wide variety of results. So here's another set of data. This, uh, the one before that I showed you spanned 100,000 years. So we're really looking over a really wide time span. This is from a much uh, narrower range in time, just looking at European samples during the medieval period and the 19th century. And here the color scheme has changed. So here, uh, oral samples are colored in blues and greens and gray are the unknowns or um, non-oral samples. And here you can see we have really excellent preservation across the board. Almost all of our uh, uh, sequences and our data sets have um, what is predicted to be an oral source. So this is a really outstandingly preserved set of dental calculus from the European 19th century and medieval periods. And you can see the sites up there in the corner where they're located from. Beyond just looking at preservation, you can also use these tools to identify what kind of samples you have. 
So we had this problem in the past. This is a problem Maxime and I worked on where we were working with paleo feces, but we weren't sure if it was human or dog. And so we used source predict to under, better understand what our sample was to distinguish human paleo feces from archeological dog poop from potentially something else. So this source tracking approach can also be used to help you identify samples um, in this way. All right. So some pro tips here, you wanna choose your sources wisely. So you have to be careful about how you choose your sources um, so that you get the best results out. For each source, you need at least 10 data sets, at least for source tracker. Um, plaque and dental plaque and calculus have similar but distinct profiles. So it's worth including both as sources. And if you're trying to identify um, environmental contamination, using archeological bone material is actually gonna be a better proxy for the necrobiome than soil. So picking something like femur bone or a toe bone, something that's quite far away from the microbiome because the types of bacteria that degrade skeletal material are distinct from the general soil. So you'll get more accurate estimations of the necrobiome if you pick something like archeological bone as your, um, as your proxy for the necrobiome. One thing that's important to keep in mind is what does this unknown category mean? It actually means two things, and this is important. It's the proportion of your data set that cannot be assigned to any source, meaning that it's from something that you didn't provide the program, so it's something else. But it's also the proportion that can be assigned to more than one source. And so that is also important to keep in mind when understanding what that unknown part of the plot means. Okay, so now we've covered who's there and how preserved is my sample. Now let's talk about how you might be able to clean it up. So now that you have a sense of its preservation, you can clean it up for your downstream analyses and we use a two-step process. So the first one is there are gonna be some samples that you have that are just so degraded and so altered that it's really not worth carrying them forward. And so you can use a, a tool that developed by James called Cooper Deck um, to identify and remove the samples that are very degraded. So this is for identifying a sample that it's not worth continuing on. Um, you can also use another tool called decontam, and this identifies and removes low-level contaminant, uh, low-level laboratory and soil contaminant taxa from your data sets. So this does not remove samples, this removes taxa from your existing taxon lists. All right, so let's see here. So some samples, as I said, they're so degraded and altered post-mortem that they aren't worth analyzing. So CooperDeck will help you identify them and help you remove them. So it removes samples. So here's an example of what Cooper Duck looks like. So here's our references and controls. And for this particular example, we're looking at an oral microbiome sample. And what we're looking at is to the degree to which it's resembling um, known oral bacteria. So we put in modern reference subgingival plaque and supergingival plaque. And we have uh, these cumulative uh, decay curves here. They're marked in blue because this means they're passing our thresholds. They resemble oral bacteria. And then we have a series of other uh, uh, potential uh, references and controls like the gut microbiome, skin microbiome, environmental controls, sediments, the extraction control, library control. And they have a very different uh, cumulative decay curve. And they are flagged here as red because they fail, the, um, they fail the test for being an oral sample. We can then apply our, our actual samples here, which come from dental calculus from humans and non-human primates. And we can go through each one. We can see that our howler monkeys all had really good oral microbiome preservation. So we're gonna keep all of those samples in our data set. Some of our gorillas at some of the museums actually had a high degree of degradation. So we're gonna take those samples out and not carry them forward and so forth. And you can see that in general for our humans, it's pretty good, but Neanderthals, as you might expect being so old, we had more that were too degraded to analyze. So we used Cooper Deck to identify samples that we felt were not well enough preserved to carry forward. Decontam, you can kind of think is almost like a surgical removal of the contaminants within the data sets that you're keeping. So these are data sets that are pretty good and you wanna keep them. They do have a good microbiome signal there that's preserved, but it still has some soil contaminants or other things that you don't wanna analyze. And so you can use decontam to remove them. So, um, you want to remove these stubborn contaminant taxa. Because if you leave them in, these contaminant taxa could bias or skew your diversity patterns, leading to spurious results and false conclusions. 
And so it'll help you identify these obvious contaminants and remove them. And you provide this a tool with your contaminant sources. You might get past it some data sets from your laboratory blanks or from some archaeological bone, and it will remove those contaminating taxa from your data sets. All right, so now we've covered who's there, how preserved is my sample, and how do I clean up my data set? Now you've got your cleaned up data set, and now you have your reconstructed microbial community. So what can we do with that? So at this point, what um, a lot of the analyses that I'm talking about really refer mostly to microbiome work. If your primary interest is in, is in pathogens, this is less relevant for you. But um, uh, if you're interested in the community itself, these are some of the things you might want to examine. Within your microbial community, um, you want to look at the ecology. We're going to use a lot of tools that come out of the field of ecology in order to understand how these communities function and work and their structure. And there's two, two common ways um, that we look at the ecology of these communities is to examine their alpha diversity and their beta diversity. So alpha diversity measures the variation within a single sample. And there's two ways you can do this. You can look at the species richness. Uh, one of the statistics you can use is something called the Chow One Index. And what this does is it asks how many different species are in my micro microbial community. Is it just one species or is it a thousand species? And those are very different communities. You can also look at something called species evenness. And for this, a lot of people use the Shannon Index. And this asks how balanced are the species abundances in my community? Do I have a few taxa that dominate the assemblage? Maybe I have two species that represent 90% of my data. Or do I have a thousand species that each represent 0.1% of my data? And so that's your species evenness. And different types of microbial communities have different alpha diversities, um, different species riches, different uh, species evenness. Now, while alpha diversity is extremely important and is used a lot within ecology, within the field of ancient metagenomics, we tend not to focus very much on the alpha diversity. And that is because it is very easily skewed in ancient samples by preservation and trace contaminants. So if you are unable to remove all of your soil contaminants, um, it can really inflate your alpha diversity or skew it. So that's just something to be careful about when interpreting your ancient alpha diversity. Um, here's an example of where the alpha diversity um, is quite interesting. So this is a plot from the 2012 Human Microbiome Project, the first project to really characterize the, the diverse microbial ecologies of the human body. And this is plotting the relative alpha diversity for the different um, body sites. So this is for the nose, um, this is for the, your elbows, um, and this is for your, your ears. Um, and then this section here is for your mouth. And then this is your stool, your feces, and this is uh, vaginal samples. And what you'll see is that the body sites within the human body that have the highest alpha diversity are your dental plaque, and your feces, your gut microbiome. And that's pretty interesting because when we're thinking archeologically, it's typically the ancient oral microbiome or the ancient gut microbiome that we are most often studying and they have the highest species richness of the human body. So they have a lot of diverse species um, in those two locations. All right, so you can also look at something called beta diversity. Your beta diversity is a measure of the variation between your samples. How similar or different are your samples to each other? There's several ways to do this. The one we use most commonly, uh, most often, is called the Bray Curtis dissimilarity uh, metric. Um, and it asks to what degree are the taxa shared between my samples at the same abundances? So if your Bray Curtis uh, metric is zero, it means they're exactly the same. And if they're one, they're completely different. You can also use a Jacquard distance metric. And this asks to what degree the taxa are shared between your samples, but ignoring the abundance. We don't use Jacquard distance very often in ancient metagenomics. And that's because, um, as I said before, if you have any trace contaminants in there, that can really alter your species counts. And so it can inflate your Jacquard distance because it's not weighted by abundance. And we know we have a problem with false positives in our low abundance taxa. So Jacquard distance, while it's used in modern uh, metagenomics a lot, we don't tend to use it in ancient metagenomics. And last, there's the unifract distance. Unifract is really cool. 
And it's not just looking at how many species two organisms share, but it really looks at how phylogenetically similar the taxa are <clears throat> in the samples. And you can run that using either taking into account abundance, which is called weighted, or not taking into account abundance, which is called unweighted. So you can visualize the beta diversity of a given set of samples using principal coordinates analysis. And here's an example of a PCOA based on break curtis distances of the microbial communities present in the human microbiome. And you can see that different um, samples from different uh, sources, so the oral cavity, the gastrointestinal cavity, the urogenital uh, area, skin, and uh, nasal samples tend to cluster together into discrete uh, microbial communities that are distinct from one another. And you can see this using your beta diversity plot. We can also use the, apply the same thing, hold on, there we go, to our ancient samples. So here is a kind of similar plot. It's another PCOA based on Bray Curtis distances again, this time of the microbial communities that are in archeological samples, including paleofeces and dental calculus. And from this, you can see some really interesting patterns. So for example, here you can see the compositional differences between modern dental calculus in the dark pink and dental plaque in the light pink. And you can see that the archeological dental, dental calculus overlaps with the modern calculus. Likewise, in the paleofeces, you can see over here the modern feces samples. You can see the industrialized feces um, uh, is in a kind of or dark orange, and the non-industrialized feces is shown here in uh, a kind of gold color. And paleofeces uh, overlaps uh, and resembles these modern non-industrialized uh, fecal communities. So these are some of the ways that you can use beta diversity to explore the relationships between your samples. Now, it's possible, you're probably familiar with the term PCA, but you might not have heard of PCOA before. What is this? What's this principal coordinates analysis? Well, it's an ordination method that you can apply to your distance matrix, which you've created. So your Bray Curtis, Jack Arger, Unifrac distance matrix. And then you can use it to visualize your beta diversity in a plot. But this is not the only way to analyze your data. You can alternatively take a very different approach to explore the relationships between your samples, uh, taking a compositional approach. And to do this, what you would do is you would transform your data in your taxon table using a centered log ratio transformation or a CLR. And then you would build instead a Euclidean distance matrix and then perform PCA or a principal components analysis to visualize uh, your samples. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that a Euclidean distance matrix built from a CLR transform data is also called an Atchison distance matrix. PCAs can only be performed on Euclidean uh, uh, distance matrices. So which approach is better, the sort of standard approach that we outlined first or this compositional approach that takes this CLR and Atchison distance matrix approach? Well, it's a bit of a philosophical debate. There's definitely strong feelings on both sides. Both are valid for metagenomics, but have different caveats. Both represent your data in slightly different ways and go ahead and try both and see if you get consistent results. The bottom line is one of the important differences between these two approaches is that they deal with zero counts in the data matrix and or in the, in the taxon tables and also with discrepancies in sampling efforts. So how much sequencing effort you put into different sets of samples, they handle those problems differently. You can read more about the growing importance of compositional approaches to microbiome analysis um, in this uh, review by Gloridal in 2017, which I put in the reading list. If you're intrigued and you want to learn more, there is much more to learn about distance matrices and understanding how to characterize the differences between your samples in terms of their microbial communities. And Pat Schloss, who created Mother, has a really great series of videos on YouTube that he's created about ecological analyses and distances, and he explains in detail how to use the R package vegan for microbiome analysis. So feel free to check them out if you want more information on the, on the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of these different approaches. All right, so we've covered who's there, how preserved is my sample, and how do I clean up my data set, and we've talked a little bit about how we explore this microbial community. I'm gonna end here for today because tomorrow, uh, today with Maxine, you're going to actually practice some of this and try out some of these tools. And then tomorrow, you're gonna dig into this community a bit more by exploring genome assemblies with Alex.
um, you're going to be looking at particular pathogens with the other Alex, and you're going to be looking at functions on Friday with Irina. I'm happy to answer questions. And like yesterday, I have put a kind of bibliography at the end of my slides where you can read up about all these tools and all these different issues if you want to. Um, they're all here in case you want to learn more. And I'll stop my presentation somehow. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have. There. So feel free to come up to the podium or just type your question in chat. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay, oh, very good. Um, thank you very much for the for the talk. And uh, I I have one question. Uh, I wondered, based if based on your experience, uh, is it possible to discriminate uh, like post excavation storage contaminants uh, based only like the fragment length uh, of the sequences, or it is not mm. possible? It's a good question. So can you use fragment length to discriminate between ancient, ancient DNA and more recent contaminants? I'd say it's really tricky um, for two reasons. Um, I think that that, you know, so a lot of the post-excavation contaminant DNA um, is modern and probably comes from living bacterial cells that have complete genomes. The way that we build our library by not doing a shearing step we ensure that they never even integrate into our libraries, and so we never see them. And that's one way of um, focusing on your ancient DNA. So much of that post-excavation contamination we exclude actually already in the library. For the things that are degraded enough to build into a library, you do have that long distribution. So we talked about how the mode is usually like 30 to 50 base pairs, but you have this long tail that goes up to like 150. Um, we have done a little bit of exploration of like what's in the 150, you know, what are the things, what are those longest reads? Um, we haven't done a lot of exploration of that, but we have found that um, among those longest reads are things that are clearly, for example, from calculus, oral bacteria. So it really does seem that there, that for the ancient microbiome, there is this distribution and some of those very long reads are in fact endogenous. So we don't typically use the fragment length to um, determine that. I think a better and more reliable indicator for you will be the damage rates because you will see um, some uh, sequences or some species that you might find that really just do not have any damage on them, even though they're fragmented. And I think those are that's a good indication that they are recent. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I am. What is better? Is it better to choose one of the protocols or do uh, maybe both, for example, choose Kraken and, and also Malta? So I did, I'm not sure I heard your question. It cut out a little bit. Your question was, how do you choose between Kraken and? Yeah, it's better choose only one or it's better do two and see the difference between them. I think it's. OK, yeah. So James was just saying that today during the round table, we'll talk a lot about how to pick your best taxonomic profile, uh, profile profiler. Um, my advice, I think it's a good idea to always try two. So maybe try Metaflon and Kraken. And if the results are really similar, then you can be um, confident that the, that the 
that you have a good idea now of what that community is. If they're very different, that leads you, that might lead you to think there's something going wrong and you want to explore that a bit more. So I would recommend using multiple profilers. And the things that they agree on, you can be quite confident about. And the things that they disagree on, you need to dig in a little bit more and find out why they disagree. It could be because Metaflon just doesn't have that species in the database, and that happens. Or it could be that you're getting some false positives from Kraken. So I think comparing the results of two different profilers can be really helpful depending on what exact question you want to go after. OK, thank you. And the other thing, um, I know that Alexander will talk about this tomorrow. So for the pathogen screening, um, he his general approach is to use um, malt um, to look for any evidence of a pathogen at all, even five reads from a pathogen. Um, and when you're looking at those very raw results and you have very few reads, so maybe five reads out of five million, um, there is a good chance that those could be false positives. So we would never just move forward on those five reads and say we found a pathogen. It's just not enough evidence. But what we use that for is as a screening tool to identify candidates for more laboratory work. So if we have a sample that turns up five reads to, let's say, um, Treponema pallidum, the causative agent of syphilis, then we say this is a candidate. Let's do a capture enrichment for the Treponema pallidum genome. And then if we can recover a full genome, then we do a study on that. So if you're using this for pathogens, then we will use these profilers as screening tools, but it's not enough to really say that this particular species is there. If you have a species you care a lot about, it's very important to you, then it's really good to do genome mapping and really to make sure that you don't, that you actually have good coverage across the whole genome and not just one region. Sometimes bacteria will have a certain region of the genome that's pretty nonspecific. And maybe it's a gene that has, or part of a gene or a transposon that might be shared by many bacteria. And so you'll maybe have, let's say you have 10,000 reads to Yersinia pestis, but it turns out all the reads are to the exact same sequence. And that tells you that's probably a false positive. Instead, what you want to see is an even distribution of reads across the whole genome. And that gives you a better sense that it's really, truly present. So if you have a particular bacteria that you really care about, then these profiling step is just the first step in a long process of authenticating it. Whereas if what you're more interested in is generally characterizing kind of the community overall um, and comparing across samples, um, then the profilers are pretty good because any biases they might have would be biased in the same way across all of your samples. So it doesn't have such a big effect on your interpretation. Um, oh, Anon has a question in the chat. Um, I mentioned that 16S is not a good proxy for profiling the microbiome. However, when it comes to sediments, we sometimes have thousands of samples to cover, more than 20 meters and hundreds of thousands of years. Is that, in that case, is it more cost effective to use meta barcoding? What do you think? Is it better to reduce sample size in this case to be able to more accurately but sparsely capture the diversity across such vast time periods? So yes, yeah, so Anand's asking an economic question here. So if you have thousands and thousands of samples that you want to profile, um, certainly for modern DNA, the most cost-effective way of doing that is by doing 16S amplicon metataxonomics, so amplifying up parts of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene and then sequencing them using a next-generation sequencer. But as I said, the problem that we have with ancient DNA is that our DNA fragments are so short that you have a really biased PCR amplification. And we see some very consistent artifacts. So for example, Archaea have a 55 base pair deletion in the V3 region, which means that it's going to be much easier to amplify archaea than bacteria. So we often find that when we are, if we try to do 16S amplification of a very degraded sample, you might only get archaea back um, because it won't amplify any of the bacterial sequences because there's so few that are long enough. There's also some taxa, I think Treponema and Streptococcus, that have big insertions in the V3 region. And again, that makes them very hard to recover because there's just almost no DNA in your sample that's long enough to um, land both primers to amplify. So we see a lot of really systematic biases 
um, when you try to do PCR amplification of the 16S gene in ancient samples. Now, there's another region of the 16S gene called the V4 region. The V4 region also has a lot of taxonomic information. It's very variable. And one advantage of the V4 region, is a, does, it is not length polymorphic. So there are not insertions or deletions across taxa. However, the V4 region is even longer. I forget, it's something like 200 and something bases long. So the odds that you have truly ancient bacteria sequences that are that long and something 100,000 years old is almost zero. So you're going to instead just be amplifying up more recent contaminants. So that's just something to keep in mind when doing the 16S-based approach. Um, Pooja has another question. Um, let's see, I have a basic question. Should you normalize your data to host abundance as it will vary across samples? Is it a good, good idea with respect to ancient metagenome, da ancient metagenome data, especially coming from ancient human sources? So um, I guess what I think what you're asking is, should you somehow normalize it to the amount of host DNA present? Um, and I would say no, because there's no consistency in the amount of host DNA present. So the amount of host DNA that you might find in a given sample will vary quite a lot. Um, so this is something that Maxime has actually looked at. Um, and depending on diet and lifestyle, for example, the amount of human DNA in the feces of living people today actually changes quite a lot. So there is more um, human DNA in the gut microbiome of individuals from industrialized populations than from non-industrialized populations. And this might have to do with differences in the types of diets being consumed or in differences in inflammation levels. But the amount of human DNA can vary quite a lot from person to person in these microbiome samples. So I wouldn't normalize to that. 